You asked for it, here it is. I'm returning to the best game ever made. Since my original glitch video on this game five years ago, a ton of new discoveries have been made, and a glitch playthrough today is completely different to what it was back then. As usual, everything we're about to see in this video can be done on any version of the game, and on any console that can run it. To keep me from rushing through too quickly with glitches, I'm also setting the restriction that I have to not only beat Gearman, but also the Orphan of Koss in this playthrough before I'm allowed to finish the game. With that out of the way, welcome to the workshop. We're breaking Bloodborne. This video is sponsored by Rokid and their Augmented Reality Joypack. Right, so what in the world is a Rokid? Well, I asked them and they told me that their name comes from combining the words robot and kid in the same way that Metroid originated from combining the words Metro and Android, or the way that GameStop originated from combining the words game and stop giving us examples, we get it already. Rokid makes AR glasses, not VR glasses, and that distinction is important. For one, they're way less expensive than a VR headset, and because it's a completely different technology, they don't give me the same motion sickness or headache that VR can. These glasses are essentially a portable TV for your face, so in any way you can use a TV, you can use these. There's a USB-C port in the back of the earpiece that supports video up to 1080p and 120 FPS, meaning you can connect them to any PC, game console, whatever you want as long as you have a USB-C adapter. Since this is a video on Bloodborne, I felt like I had no choice but to check, and yep, it works. This is not editing, this is not a pre-recorded video, I am actually playing Bloodborne on a pair of glasses right now. The future's weird, man. The AR Joypack includes the Rokid Max glasses and the Rokid Station, which is a portable Android TV, meaning streaming apps like YouTube, Disney+, etc. are supported too. Wait, are you watching this video on a pair of glasses right now? You'd tell me if you were, right? Click my link in the description to get a $50 discount on a pair for yourself or someone you know. And thanks again to Rokid for helping to fund the production of this video. Ah, you found yourself a hunter. When we first begin the game, we wake up in Yosefka's clinic with no weapons or items and are meant to fight our way through central Yarnum until reaching Father Gascoigne at the end, the required boss preventing progress to the next area. Surprise, surprise, we won't be doing that. Instead, we run straight ahead, past the Lycanthrope, and to the courtyard just outside the clinic. Here's a locked gate that leads to Forbidden Woods and is meant to be opened from the opposite side after beating Vicar Amelia to connect the woods to central Yarnum. We, however, are going to skip both Gascoigne and Amelia and go to the woods right now. This skip requires no items, but the spacing can be tricky, and it requires getting good RNG to execute successfully, so don't expect to get it on your first try. First, lure the wolf out from the clinic and toward the open gate that leads to central Yarnum. Now stand on the outer edge of the circular shape that the bricks make in the floor, and bait the wolf's grab attack. Just before it grabs you, roll forward and stand as close to the Forbidden Woods gate as possible, this will give you the perfect spacing for the glitch, assuming that the wolf chooses to immediately go for a second grab attack. If and when that happens, allow yourself to be grabbed, then begin mashing L1 and R1 to break out. The grab animation pushes you forward slightly and does not check for collision, so if your spacing was correct and you mash the shoulder buttons to break out fast enough, you will find yourself on the opposite side of the gate in a glitch that has defined nearly every Bloodborne speedrun since it was discovered. Now that you're on the other side of the gate, you can pull the lever to the right to open it permanently and have access to Forbidden Woods as the first area of the game. Before going there, first take the ladder up to the roof of Yosefka's clinic to grab the Canehurst Summons, an item we will need later for the particular build I have in mind for this playthrough. If you go deeper into the clinic, you can find the Yosefka Impersonator that is supposed to appear much later in the game standing on a stretcher in the back room. Because we were never meant to reach this room this early, she has no program behavior and no health bar. You can't talk to her, can't kill her, and if you push her far enough away from her spawn location, she will walk right back on her own. There's no glitch we can do with this, but get used to this sort of bizarre behavior from NPCs. The more we break this game's linearity, the more of this type of stuff we're going to see. What's more, the quote-unquote real Yosefka that stands behind the locked door at the entrance is there now, but doesn't have any collision because, once again, we were never meant to reach this area this early. This means you can pass straight through her and open the door to the clinic, which ironically does not prevent you from talking to her. I'm very sorry, but I cannot open this door. Okay, good. We've only done one glitch so far, and the game is already falling apart. From here, we can take the ladder down to Forbidden Woods and cross the Lake of Poison Water to enter the woods from the back. You should also know that doing this will break Eileen the Crow's quest line for this playthrough, permanently locking you out of collecting the air rune from killing Heinrich, 
and the Hunter rune from killing the Bloody Crow of Kanehurst. We'll get more into the consequences of this a bit later, but just know that the moment we enter Forbidden Woods this way, Eileen's quest is immediately flagged as failed. While we could continue forward and deeper into the woods, I instead turn right to go to the normal Forbidden Woods lamp. This may feel like backtracking, but it's actually the fastest way to unlock the elevator shortcut and reach the boss at the end. Once you've lit the lamp, proceed forward as normal, but hang right past the big, hairy, whatever that is, and then drop down to the area with the scurrying beast and carrion crows. This is meant to be a dead end, but due to some weird geometry in the wall, this becomes our way forward. Jump at this location toward the wall, and you will clip up on top, then roll forward and continue across the top of the wall to the village just before the windmill that holds the elevator shortcut. Be sure to drop directly onto the ground and not onto one of the rooftops, or you may get stuck behind invisible walls and have to warp back to the lamp and start over. From here, you can immediately turn right and run towards the cannon to enter the windmill and claim the elevator shortcut leading back to the lamp. In the room at the top of the elevator is Valter, the NPC that introduces the player to the League Covenant and gives them the Impurity Rune. Smack him around like he owes you money, and he will become aggressive. Lead him over to the elevator and quickly take it down. Valter will follow you off the ledge and die to fall damage, dropping 7,000 echoes, which is four times as much as we would have gotten from killing Gascoigne. But we're still not done. Valter has a bodyguard that hides in the trees near the lamp, who will also become aggressive if Valter gets attacked. We can perform the same tactic to take out this hunter as well, who drops 4,000 echoes of his own, as well as the Madara's Whistle, a weapon that no one has ever used in the history of Bloodborne. The whistle requires 18 blood tinge, so use the lamp to enter the hunter's dream for the first time, and let's spin these echoes. Since we got a point of insight from visiting the upstairs of Yusefka's clinic, the doll is already awake when we arrive, and the messengers will offer us a starting weapon and gun. From here, we could choose the saw cleaver, threaded cane, hunter axe, blunderbuss, hunter pistol, but this is a glitch playthrough. What kind of casual would I be if I took any of those? Listen, these weapons are cringe. Leave them on the ground where they belong and use these blood echoes to pump blood tinge. With our newly acquired whistle in tow, we return to the woods, take the elevator back down and follow the path all the way down to the end of the area where we encounter the Shadows of Yarnum. When we enter the arena and try to fight them now, it goes like you would expect, but that's fine because we didn't need to actually beat them, we just need to trigger them to spawn. Now when you return to the arena, the shadows will already be inside waiting for you, and there will be a new fog gate at the entrance. This is what we need to trigger the next glitch. First, go to the left wall, and then slowly creep forward until you see the prompt to enter the fog appear on the screen. Now flick the analog stick left to turn without moving your character's feet. You want to be facing as perpendicular to the fog as possible, while maintaining the prompt on screen to enter the fog. When you got it, press X, and your character will begin the animation of entering the boss room, but we are so far away from the fog itself that the animation doesn't push us as far forward as the game is expecting. Just like that, we have entered the arena without the shadows realizing that the fog has been crossed, meaning their AI never activates, and they are permanently stuck in an idle animation no matter how much damage they take. If you've seen my videos before, these sorts of freeze glitches are old news to you. With the shadows frozen, we can slap them into a group, then use the Madara's Whistle to deal an insane amount of damage for our level, finishing the boss off in just a few uses. The Whistle is legitimately a great damage dealing item, but it's so slow that it only really works for bosses that don't move. Something to keep in mind as this playthrough continues. We get 18,000 Echoes from beating the Shadows, which goes, you guessed it, straight into Blood Tinge. So now if you look at our build breakdown, you can see that we have 10% Luck, 20% skill, 15% concentrated power of will, 5% pleasure, 50% pain. We could go deeper into Bergenberth and fight Rom at this point, but there's a few things I want to do before progressing the time that far. Oh, right. I guess now is a great time to go into how the Night Cycle in Bloodborne works. There are four different times of day in this game, and each one progresses forward on the death of a major storyline boss. When you start the game, it's midday. When you kill Gascoigne, it becomes evening. When you kill Amelia, it becomes midnight. And when you kill Rom, it becomes the Blood Moon. You can go forward whenever you like by killing that respective boss, but once a boss is dead, there's no going back. We would miss out on some stuff by skipping straight from midday to the Blood Moon, so I want us to intentionally go out of our way to kill Gascoigne and progress to evening at this point. Even though progressing from midday to evening is the intended order of the game, rest assured, we definitely won't be doing it the intended way. To start off, we go through Central Yarnum as usual to make it to the Tomb of Odin and step inside. Just like with the shadows, we don't actually intend to beat Gascoigne now, but the next glitch requires triggering the cutscene so that his model is loaded behind the fog gate for the next attempt. With that taken care of, here's how to set up the next glitch. 
First return to the fog gate and then move to the left corner, spinning the camera in the opposite direction. Now sprint forward and jump at the top of the stairs to land on the third spire from the top of the handrail on the left side of the fence. Your character will roll off upon landing and end up on the fourth spire instead. This is too low to execute the glitch, so what you must do instead is quit out after touching the third spire and before landing on the fourth, so that the game thinks the last place you touch solid ground is still the third. This has to be done extremely fast, and because the menus themselves take time to open and close, you should press options and begin quitting out the moment you press circle to jump from the stairs. Do it fast enough, and when you load back into the game, you will be standing on the third spire instead of the fourth. That's the hardest part of the glitch done, but we aren't finished yet. Next, roll to the right and have the small ledge on the wall push you up vertically and give you enough height to step over the second spire on the railing. Now run against the first spire at the top and jump left, completely crossing the stairs and landing on the railing along the left wall, a place the player was obviously never intended to stand. From here, we roll toward the gargoyle statue to make it past the corner, and then continue to walk along the top of the railing like a tightrope deeper into the wall and pass through the low resolution textures that have no collision. Take it slow here. The floor below the railing does not have a hitbox, so if you fall off, you'll end up in a white void and have to restart. Follow the railing around the corner to the right through the low resolution textures until you make it out the other side. Now, simply walk forward along the remainder of the railing and you will find yourself within Father Gascoigne's boss room without ever passing through the fog, meaning that just like the shadows, Gascoigne's AI will never activate. This makes him the perfect target for the Madara's Whistle, and in four uses, Gascoigne will fall, progressing the game's time to evening and granting us access to Cathedral Ward. Next, we need access to the Chalice Dungeons, and that means getting a Chalice. The easiest one to access is the Thumeru Chalice granted after defeating the Bloodstarved Beast, which means we're headed to Old Yarnum. Take a left out of Odin Chapel and follow the path straight ahead all the way down until reaching the barred doors, with the note warning us not to enter. Joke's on them, I can't read. As soon as we step outside, we will be utterly accosted by a crazy man yelling from the rooftops. Huh, kinda reminds me of when I lived in Memphis. Rather than continuing left like we're intended to, go to the right instead and drop all the way down to this platform, then walk up to the railing, aligning yourself to be just left of this decorative pillar of the roof one tier below. Now back up as far as you can, start running, and jump over the railing to bounce off of the lower roof and land on the end of this stone barrier. This, once again, is a place we were never meant to stand. It's safe to run on the open air just ahead, but you'll have to jump at this point or you'll fall straight through the roof. Next, roll into the tent-shaped roof on your left, which also has no collision, and finally drop straight down onto the street below. You should recognize where you are at this point, and if you like, take the spiral stairs back up the building you just dropped down from in order to properly open the shortcut door so that you have easy, consistent access to the end of Old Yarnum without ever completing the area. From here, it's easy to reach the Bloodstar Beast, and at this point, you might be wondering how I plan to freeze this boss as well. Uh, yeah, about that. There is no known freeze for the Bloodstar Beast at this point in time, and with how insanely fast and frantic this thing moves, the idea of killing it with the slow Madaris whistle is completely out of the question. But thankfully for us, the Bloodstar Beast's ridiculous speed is exactly how we're going to defeat it. Lure him to the back of the arena, behind the altar, and stand on this specific tile. Then when the BSB approaches, if he chooses to do the long range claw slash, roll to the left to dodge the attack. Assuming the spacing was correct and the right attack was chosen by his RNG, the Bloodstar Beast will rush forward, get caught between the unbroken pots in the back of the room before clipping straight through the wall and falling out of bounds. After a minute or two of falling through the void, he will hit the kill plane and you'll get credit for defeating him, despite dealing no damage at all. This is not the only place in this arena that the Bloodstar Beast can suddenly launch himself through a wall. There are videos of it on YouTube happening in all sorts of places, but standing on this one specific tile and having unbroken pots in the back of the room is a strategy that I find to be the most repeatable and consistent. Now that we have our Thumeru Chalice, warp back to the Hunter's Dream, and let's get to work finishing our build. First thing to note here is that the next glitch will only work if you're playing online, meaning that it requires a subscription to PlayStation Plus. Boo! This should be no surprise to you as what I'm about to show is probably the most well-known exploit in all of Bloodborne today. When you load into the Hunter's Dream, Go left to one of the Chalice Altars and choose to search by Chalice Glyph. In the pop-up window, enter C-U-M-M-M-F-P-K. This will open a Chalice with a glitch name and with glitch dungeon rights. 
That's because this is a hacked dungeon known as a false depth chalice. When we load in, you'll notice that our HP bar is only a spec, and that's because the creator has stacked so many cursed attributes on top of one another that we lose 99% of our maximum HP when we enter this dungeon. But the amount of blood echoes we get for defeating enemies will be massively boosted as well. Take a few steps in and look to the left, where an HP bar will appear within the wall and begin to deplete on its own. Now simply wait, and you will suddenly receive over 83,000 blood echoes in one drop. Okay, so what exactly is going on here? Well, like I said, this is a hacked dungeon using a modded version of Bloodborne running on a PlayStation with custom firmware. This dungeon was handmade to grant the greatest number of echoes as possible in the shortest amount of time using nothing but intended chalice dungeon mechanics arranged in an ideal way. The creator placed an enemy hunter spawn point on top of one of the swinging axe traps, something that should never happen in a normal chalice dungeon. Each time the axe swings, it takes a chunk out of his health bar, and because of the increased HP reduction this dungeon was set to have, the blood echoes he drops are massively boosted as well. You could manually run into this room and kill the hunter yourself each time to get the same result, but I wouldn't recommend it. Every time you re-enter the dungeon, the hunter respawns and the axe trap kills him once again, meaning you can get 83,000 blood echoes this way every 60 seconds. And even better, you only need PS Plus to search for the dungeon originally. After it's in your game, you can let your subscription expire and continue to access the dungeon for echoes whenever you want. This gives us more than enough resources to completely max out our blood tinge, meaning the damage of this little whistle is about to go through the roof. Why don't we test that out? The next glitch I have in mind requires the Rune Workshop tool, which is the reward for beating the Witch of Hemwick. But that is our new goal. We warp to Cathedral Ward, take the elevator up to the workshop, drop all the way down to the bottom, and then take the elevator up from there to end up behind the locked gates in Cathedral Ward. Next we run to the left of the Grand Cathedral to enter the woods just before Hemwick Charnel Lane, and make our way all the way to the boss at the end without fighting anything. I also know of no means to freeze the Witch of Hemwick, but this boss isn't particularly known for speed in the first place. The only real danger in this fight at all is the fact that she spawns those black monsters known as Mad Ones. This is a fairly well-known trick, but if you enter the boss room to collect the point of insight you earn from encountering a boss, then warp back to the Hunter's Dream and spend every point of insight you have at the Bath Messengers so that you have zero, when you return to the Witch of Hemwick's boss room, the Mad Ones won't spawn at all and you only have the two witches to deal with. As you might imagine, she is way too slow to dodge the Madar's whistle, and since we have max blood tinge, this fight is over in a matter of minutes. With the witches defeated, we have access to a new lamp and to the back room holding the rune workshop tool. Now that we can equip runes, why don't we get some? The next glitch is one of my favorite exploits in Bloodborne and correlates so well with what this build is becoming. First, warp to Odin Chapel and kill the NPC in the red cloak that sits in the corner. The item he drops is the Tier 3 Formless Odin Rune, which grants extra Quicksilver bullets. There is only one copy of this rune available for playthrough, and when it appears, you should not pick it up. Instead, walk out of the chapel toward the area where we fought Gascoigne, take the ladder down, run through the cemetery, and down the stairs. Touch this coffin at the back wall, then head straight backwards in the direction we came, back through the cemetery, back up the ladder, and back into the chapel. If you've seen my video on Dark Souls 3, you will likely understand what we're doing already. By killing an NPC or enemy that drops an item only once, and then manually walking so far away as to load a new area, then walk back, the area loads once again, including the corpse of the NPC or enemy that you've killed, but the game doesn't check to see if it has already spawned the item already, so it mistakenly creates a new copy. This glitch was first discovered in Dark Souls 3, and can be used to duplicate Titanite slabs among many other items, but since Dark Souls 3 uses the Bloodborne engine, this glitch is also possible in Bloodborne. Now when we return to the chapel and loot the item dropped by the NPC here, we will be able to pick up an additional copy of Formless Odin for every trip we made in and out of the chapel. This is not the only location in Bloodborne where this glitch is useful either. The same technique can be done with Willem and Bergenworth to duplicate copies of the Tier 3 Eye Rune, which makes enemies more likely to drop items. Equipping three copies of Eye can make farming for bloodstones significantly faster. And speaking of bloodstones, this glitch works on scurrying beasts too. Most notably, the area in the DLC that connects the Hunter's Nightmare to the Research Hall has two scurrying beasts at the bottom of the room just before Adeline, and another scurrying beast near the lamp just before Ludwig. By killing all three and then running back and forth between these two locations, you can duplicate a ridiculous amount of bloodstone chunks. This is a glitch I recommend for any playthrough, just to avoid ever having to farm for these things. 
Note, however, that this only works on dropped items, not items found in the environment, meaning you cannot duplicate bloodstone rocks this way. If you do need multiple rocks, here are three Chalice Dungeon Glyphs you can use to get some free ones. But back to our build. By equipping three copies of the formless Odin rune we duplicated, we can set our Quicksilver Bullet maximum to 29, but we can still do one better. By taking the elevator up from Odin Chapel and then rolling off midway, you can reach a chest that holds a tier 4 formless Odin rune in the rafters of the church. Once again, this rune is limited to one per playthrough and is found in a chest, meaning that it can't be duplicated. But by swapping out one of the tier 3 runes we duplicated for this, we can reach a Quicksilver Bullet maximum of 30, a number never intended to be possible. With this many bullets, I think it's time we finally get a gun. And with 99 blood tinge, the choice was obvious. As you might imagine, having a reliable high damage dealing ranged attack is going to completely change the way we approach combat in this build. So I thought a costume change was in order as well. In order to access the DLC and eventually the fishing hamlet, we need the Eye of a Blood Drunk Hunter. This is an item that spawns in the Hunter's Dream once the game time progresses to midnight or later. We could go kill Amelia now to make that happen, but I have other plans for her, so instead we'll be jumping from evening straight to the Blood Moon by killing Rom. Rom has been accessible for us ever since we performed the freeze glitch on the shadows, but with a maxed out Evelyn in our arsenal, we finally have a safe and powerful way to take it out without getting too close to the spiders. In case you didn't know, Bone Marrow Ash absolutely wrecks this boss, and you can free aim to hit Rom above its protective head even when it's facing you, meaning we never have to risk getting too close. With Rom defeated, the Blood Moon begins, meaning items in shops just got significantly more expensive, and stronger enemies begin spawning. After the cutscene, we are teleported to the room just before the upper part of Yahar Gull. Uh, pay no attention to the giant nightmare creature on the wall, you're just hallucinating. This area of the game only becomes accessible once the Blood Moon has been triggered, so be sure to step inside and light the lamp, lest we get permanently locked out of Yahar Gull and it becomes impossible to finish the game. From here, we can pick up the newly spawned Eye from the ground in the Hunter's Dream, and then use it to get grabbed by the Amygdala and Cathedral Ward and be taken into the Nightmare. This area is an alternate, more dangerous version of Cathedral Ward, but nothing stops us from running past everything to go straight to the boss at the end. A few enemies end up in our way, but that's nothing a little rootin' tootin' cowboy shootin' can't take care of. Seriously, if you've never tried a full blood tinge build in this game, you're severely missing out. It's awesome. We grab the lamp in the church just before Ludwig, and then proceed down the stairs to the bloody alleyway to pick up the Whirligig Saw. Sound off in the comments if you know where this is headed. The Whirligig Saw is unique in that it is the only right-handed weapon that has a damage over time attack performed by holding L2 which continues until you release the button or run out of stamina. However, if you begin this attack, quickly pause the game, and unequip the Whirligig Saw, the game still thinks you're performing the attack, despite L2 now corresponding with the weapon in your left hand, since your right hand is now empty. This will allow you to continuously fire guns without consuming Quicksilver bullets, and without consuming any stamina, since guns aren't programmed to use stamina in the first place. Check it out, the game is so confused about what's taking place right now, it's even including the first part of the flame sprayer animation, which is why you see a little cloud of fire being shot out alongside the bullet. This is known as the rapid fire glitch, and in practice, goes a bit like this. Because this glitch consumes no resource, you could theoretically continue it indefinitely, but it requires you to rhythmically press L2 rather than just holding it and learning this timing can be a bit tricky at first. Too slow, and you'll break the glitch. Too fast, and you'll break the glitch. Moving with the left analog stick in any way will also break the glitch. But stand perfectly still, and get the timing just right, and this is by far the most devastating technique in all of Bloodborne. As fantastic as this is against the Cleric Beast, a boss with 3000 HP, the next boss blocking our way is Ludwig, 
and he has over 16,000. But again, the rapid fire glitch works with any firearm and doesn't consume bullets. Who says we have to use the Evelyn? Clint Eastwood is the biggest yellow belly in the West. First, we make our way to the end of the Old Hunter's Nightmare and encounter Ludwig once to spawn him into the game and trigger the appearance of a fog gate. Now return to the fog gate and similarly to the Shadows of Yarnum, proceed to the right wall and move as far away from the fog as possible while still retaining the prompt on screen. If your spacing is as you should be, your character will pass through the fog and end up stuck inside the corner of the decorative pillar within the boss room. From here, one of two things will happen. Either the game will push your character out through the floor, at which point you can pause the game and quit out to make another attempt at the glitch, or the game will push you forward out into the boss room itself, which of course never activates Ludwig's AI. This has absolutely nothing to do with the rapid fire glitch and can be done on any playthrough regardless of your build. It just so happens that this gives us plenty of time to get in position and trigger the rapid fire glitch in hours. Ludwig will not move even while taking damage, but once the second phase triggers and the cutscene begins, he will reactivate. So you have to be fast with your fingers to trigger the rapid fire glitch a second time and take him out before you get hit. Luckily for us, the damage output of this glitch is insane, so the battle ends up looking like this. Okay, but let's say you've been stuck on Ludwig for ages and Phase 2 is specifically what's been giving you trouble. Don't worry baby, I got you. First, return to the poison lake that lies in between Yusefka's clinic and the Forbidden Woods that we ran through at the very beginning of the game. Search through the swamp and pick up this specific guaranteed blood gem, the triangular Dirty Blood Gemstone 3. This adds 9.6 points of rapid poison damage to any weapon you socket it into, and rapid poison isn't exactly what it sounds like. There are two types of poison in Bloodborne, slow poison, which is exactly what you think it is and makes enemies take damage over time, and rapid poison, which performs more like bleeding does in the Soul series, making enemies take a sudden burst of damage when it procs. Socket the rapid poison gem into a weapon, then repeat the freezes before to enter the boss room without triggering Ludwig's AI. Now make your way up to Ludwig, and just start rolling. There is a bug in Bloodborne's code that makes the hitbox for either poison statuses triggered during part of your character's rolling animation if you're holding a weapon that can inflict it. Though we can't see it, Ludwig's rapid poison bar is slowly filling as we continue to roll. And boy do I mean slowly. Ludwig has such high poison resist that this takes, unironically, 20 minutes of rolling to trigger. But once it does, it will not only instantly one-shot Ludwig's phase one, it will also one-shot phase two as well. See baby, I told you I got you. Continuing on with our playthrough, we still need to take out the Living Failures and Maria in order to reach the Fishing Hamlet. And I would love to be dramatic about this and build up suspense about how difficult these bosses are to defeat and what we have to do to outsmart them, but no, they were both really easy and crumpled to the rapid fire glitch like a wet paper towel. It's like shooting a boss directly in the face with 35 cannonballs is really good or something, I go figure. Now that we've unlocked the Fishing Hamlet, there is one more glitch I have to show off before we fight the Orphan. This was one included in my original Bloodborne video from years ago, and I'm happy to report that it still works today. Once you enter the hamlet, grab the first lamp, then run past all the enemies in the opening section to make it to the lighthouse hut, and grab that lamp as well. Now step outside, going around the left side of the hut and make your way down the plank. Next, drop off the platform down to the ledge below, and cross the bridge to take out this magician who continuously casts lightning at you. Having him out of the picture will make the next glitch easier to perform. Now head back across the bridge in the direction that you came and follow the scurrying beast down the hole in the floor. Take out the fish enemy that throws molotovs and then face the rightmost corner with all the rocks. This is meant to be a wall that keeps the player in bounds, but its hitbox is so polygonal that with the properly timed jump, it's possible to clip up and over on top of the wall itself, then walk along the wall to drop down to this out of bounds area. From here, you can jump onto this ledge then roll deeper into the wall to trigger the loading zone of the final area of the fishing hamlet and have it load around your character as you fall, putting you back in bounds and giving you immediate access to the lever that triggers the shortcut elevator back to the lighthouse hut and placing you directly in front of the orphan's boss room with the vast majority of the fishing hamlet skipped. Although I don't know of a reliable permanent freeze for the orphan of Koss at this time, it turns out we don't really need one. The rapid fire cannon kills the orphan so quickly that it doesn't even have time to complete the animation of switching to its second phase form. It was just assumed that if you killed the orphan of Kaz, you did it during phase two. 
and so the developers never programmed a dying animation for the Phase 1 Orphan. Because the game has no animation to pull, he's just here now. No health bar, no reactions, no attacks, just here. Okay. Considering that the Orphan is currently undergoing traumatic shock, maybe it's time we leave the DLC and actually complete the main game. If you recall, the last thing we did was defeat Rom, trigger the Blood Moon, and unlock Upper Yahar Gull. But this is not the only thing that triggers by way of the Blood Moon. Remember how I said that the very first glitch we performed at the start of the video would permanently break Eileen's quest line? It's time to face the consequences of that. If you do not help Eileen defeat Henrik before the beginning of the Blood Moon, she will go mad and begin killing hunters indiscriminately. When this happens, she will be waiting for you within the Grand Cathedral, aka the boss room for Amelia, a boss we skipped. So what happens if Eileen spawns within Amelia's boss room while Amelia is still alive? Both Amelia and Eileen will be aggressive towards you simultaneously, but they can also deal damage to one another in the process of trying to attack you. Anyone that has had to fight Eileen will tell you she is very strong. Set this glitch up, and you can simply run around the boss room and wait for Eileen to take out Amelia for you. Because of this, some people refer to this as the Summon Eileen glitch, since in a way, she's helping you defeat a boss like an NPC summon would. But I personally like to think of it more as like dating a girl with borderline personality disorder. You're on the same team, you're working together for the same goals, but she also wants you dead, probably. After defeating Amelia, however you choose to do it, you will be able to touch Lawrence's skull and watch the cutscene which triggers the beginning of midnight in-game. Of course, we are doing this during the Blood Moon, a time period that is supposed to follow midnight. This means that we actually transition back in time to an earlier state, and is appropriately called the Time Travel Glitch. This has multiple benefits, including significantly reducing the prices of all items from shops, but can absolutely softlock and end your playthrough if you don't know what you're doing. For one, it permanently closes the gates to Upper Yahar Gull, so it's absolutely mandatory that you light at least one lamp within the area during the Blood Moon for you to teleport back to, or you will have no way of entering the area and finishing the game. Seeing Upper Yahar Gull during midnight with everything illuminated blue like this is not supposed to be possible, and as a result, the game has no enemies to load for this area during this time period. That means we can run straight through and light all the lamps along the way with nothing holding us back. That is, until reaching the Hypogean Jail that the Snatchers will take you to if you're kidnapped, since this one specific part of your Hargol can optionally be accessed early. Also note, this lamp is supposed to be usable up until the Blood Moon, at which point it breaks. Because we have broken the lamp and then magically put it back together by time traveling, when we try to interact with it, it just does... this. Huh. You know, if I had a million guesses, I don't know that the lamp says asterisk would have been one. We continue forward down into the street, all the way to the dead end with the dogs and three madman's knowledge on the ground. If we were here during the Blood Moon, these gates would be open, but since we time traveled back to midnight, they are closed to prevent players from continuing deeper toward the One Reborn. That's fine, because we can go back to the first lamp and use the elevator instead as an alternate route to pass by the closed gate. Uh... Okay, this might be a problem. Theoretically, this elevator should be working, unless the game is programmed to specifically disable it during midnight to prevent a potential sequence break. We also can't reopen the gates because the trigger for that is defeating Rom, something we've already done. If we can't get past the closed gate one way or another, and can't reach the one reborn, it will be impossible to complete the game. Thankfully, I do have one more trick up my sleeve to potentially get us out of this soft lock. First, head back to the second lamp in Upper Yahar Gull, the one known as your Hargold Chapel, and run outside, dropping down onto this platform. Next, jump up onto this steeple with the decorative ridge around it, which our character can stand on. Finally, hold circle and run up against the steeple itself in order to build up to sprint speed, and jump off to the right, over the bottomless pit, and down onto the platform below. This will trigger the top-down glitch, also sometimes known as the death cam glitch. Because we jumped over a bottomless pit, the game did not expect us to survive the jump, so instead it locked the camera overhead and is waiting for the death animation to play. However, because we are still very much alive, we can take this opportunity to walk to new areas of the game without triggering loading zones along the way. In other words, when we make it to the locked gate from before, the gate won't be loaded in at all, meaning we can pass right through it as though it were open. From here, we quit the game and reload again to take control of the camera, and just like that, softlock escaped. 
The top-down glitch has multiple uses in areas all over the game and is not unique to Yahar Gol, but it can only be used to skip barriers that load in from loading zones and requires you to be able to make a jump over a bottomless pit and survive in order to trigger the glitch. As anyone who has used this glitch in any of the Souls games will tell you, the controls become extremely unintuitive and confusing while this glitch is active. So, here are some tips to help you navigate. It's tank controls. Up on the analog stick is move forward, right on the analog stick is turn clockwise, left on the analog stick is turn counterclockwise, and down on the analog stick is spin in place, something you never want to press. So even though I'm moving in what appears to be down from this camera perspective, I'm actually holding up on the analog stick to walk forward in the direction my character is facing. Whenever you want to deactivate the glitch, simply quit the game and reload, and you will find yourself in wherever location you were last standing with the loading zones returned to their normal functions. As for us, now that we've skipped the lock gate, we can continue forward to enter the boss room with the One Reborn. When you fight this boss, it's obviously supposed to be during the Blood Moon, so the Blood Moon is here as part of the cutscene. But the game doesn't check to see if it should also unload the normal moon from the skybox. That means that for this one cutscene only, we get two copies of the moon in the sky. To those of you in the comments who always ask about duplication glitches, this is what you wanted, right? We could fight the one reborn as usual now to reach the Nightmare of Mensis, but since when are we following intended mechanics? Since we've already watched the boss cutscene, the warp that takes us to the Nightmare of Mensis will now have spawned on the opposite side of the boss room. So if we repeat the first part of the top-down glitch from earlier, and this time continue deeper into the area, we can completely pass through the One Reborn's boss room altogether without him being loaded in, and make our way completely into the house beyond the arena, and activate the warp taking us to the nightmare. The prompt you're looking for is Inspect Mummy, so you can simply wander around in the room until it appears on screen, then press X to be taken to the lecture hall within the nightmare, One Reborn skipped. Next, we just do a lot of running. Run through the lecture hall, run through the bottom layer of the Nightmare of Mensis, take the elevator up, run to the boss arena of Michael Ash. We technically could use the rapid fire glitch here, but since Michael Ash despawns and reappears somewhere else at half health, I found it to be more trouble than it's worth. The Evelyn with some bone marrow ash is more than enough to get the job done. Also, not sure if you've seen this before, but if you use poison throwing knives to poison Michael Ash while you're above him, the game will play the animation of him teleporting away because it thinks he's taking damage but then place him right back in the same location because your character isn't close enough to warrant a new spawn point. It's really not much of a glitch, considering that we're using poison knives the way they were intended. I just think Michael Ash is a big nerd, and I recommend bullying him whenever possible. With another boss taken care of, we can finally reach the peak of the nightmare and fight Murgo's wet nurse, and this is a boss in which the rapid fire glitch does wonders. She's slow, she's big, and she eats cannonballs like they're Cocoa Puffs. This triggers the workshop within the Hunter's Dream to be set on fire, and for Gehrman to move to the garden for the final battle. If you thought this boss was going to pose any difficulty whatsoever, no, he's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs too. Funny, I always pegged Gehrman as a Kellogg's kind of guy. With the nightmare slain and Gehrman taken care of, we can finally put Clint Eastwood in his wheelchair and let him have that nap. He's earned it. Once the final cutscene ends, we start New Game Plus, meaning you can repeat the game with a fully kitted out cowboy and even properly do Eileen's questline this time by avoiding the wolf skip if you so choose. That reminds me, I completely forgot to go back and get our starting weapon. Hmm, so many choices. I think I'll pick the saw cleaver. IGN says that one's pretty good, 